John Norman Collins. Reign of Terror started in the year of 1967 and lasted until 1970. His victims were all young women of 13 to 23 who were abducted, raped and often beaten and stabbed or strangled. Although he wasn't tried for the other five murders, this is due to the fact if he had appealed, authorities would have used the other victims to stop him from being released. And that was the idea anyway. And also the state of Michigan did not have enough money to put forward the other five cases, but was satisfied that they could use it against him if needed. It was a hot evening on July the 9th in 1967 in Ysbilanti, Michigan, a 19-year-old Eastern Michigan University student, May Therese Fleischer, decided to go for a walk to cool down. She told her friend she wouldn't be long. That would be the last time her roommate would see her alive. And it wasn't until her mother called the next morning that she was reported missing. It was 28 days later and the disappearance of Mary would come to an end as her decomposed body was found near an abandoned farmhouse in Superior Township. The body had been mutilated to the point that it took a moment for the young men who had actually found her to realise it was human. Mary had come from a big family in Ispilanti and was a devout Catholic. Mary's death affected many people. A shoe had been found and Mary's parents confirmed that it was her shoe. Almost a year later, in 1968, Joan Ellsworth Shell, 20 years old, a student also at Eastern Michigan University, was staying with her parents over the weekend, but decided she wanted to meet with her boyfriend, so went back to her own apartment. They had arranged to meet in Ann Arbor around 11 o'clock at night, and the bus she was meant to take to meet up went right on past her, so she hitched a ride with three young men who had stopped as she stuck her thumb out. Nobody would see Joan again. One of these young men was called John Norman Collins, who was the driver and had told his friends that he would take Joan to Ann Arbor by himself. Therefore, he dropped the others off. Joan was found dead on a roadside in Ann Arbor by a construction workers on July the 5th, 1968. She had 25 stab wounds on her body, three stab wounds in the back, as it seemed that Joan had tried to run away. On March the 20th, 1969, 23-year-old Jane Mixer advertised on a ride board to Muskokan, her hometown, she advertised on the board at Michigan University, and this is when someone contacted her to offer a lift. Jane's body was found on the 21st of March. She was strangled with nylon stockings and shot in the head with a .22 calibre gun. Her skirt had been pulled up, exposing her genitalia. and She was laid on a tombstone at a cemetery west of Ann Arbor at Van Buren Township. A young boy had found a bag stained with blood close by. He showed it to his mother who then went out in the area where the bag was found and came across Jane Mixer's body. She had been strangled but authorities theorised that there was no sexual abuse, possibly due to the fact that she was on a period at the time. That isn't to say she hadn't been sexually assaulted. She was not killed where her body had been found. This now turned a peaceful community into a town on edge with advice not to hitchhike and parents panicking if their daughters went out, some carrying knives for protection. On March 25th, which was only four days after Jane Mixer's body was found, a nude mutilated body was found behind a vacant house on a rural area of Earhart Road literally a couple of hundred yards away from where Joan's shell had been found months earlier. 
The injuries inflicted upon the victim were the worst that one of the investigators who had worked for 30 years had ever seen. She was identified as 16-year-old high school student Marilyn Skelton, who was last seen hitchhiking in Ann Arbor. And she was outside a drive-in restaurant, Washington Avenue, only two days before her body was discovered. There are similarities between this murder and the others, with a strangulation of Igata Belt, but this time there was an increased savagery, and all the women and young girls were either in high school or University of Michigan, and attempting to hitchhike. Then in April 1969, the youngest victim of these brutal slayings was 13-year-old Dawn Bussum, whose body was dumped on Ysmilanti Road. She had been strangled with electrical wire and slashed. Police found clothing belonging to Dawn at an abandoned house in which, just a month later, had burned down due to arson. A sixth body turned up in June. Alice Callum, a recent University of Michigan graduate, was 23 and from Portage, was found in grass just off a trail in Ann Arbor. She had been stabbed and also shot in the head with a .22 caliber handgun. Law enforcement was so desperate to catch the killer or killers that they appointed Peter Hercos, a world-renowned psychic who was involved in helping with the Boston Strangler case. Peter Hercos made several predictions. He said, you are going to find a homemade ladder. You are going to arrest an individual with foreign money in his possession. And also, that individual isn't originally American. Meanwhile, 2,000 miles away, Roxy Phillips, 17 years old, at Salinas, California, was found beaten and strangled and her body was left on some poison oak outside Salinas. A cutlass car with Michigan plates was seen pulling up to Roxy Phillips. Nobody would actually connect this murder to the Michigan murders until later. It turned out that Roxy had hitched a lift. However, witnesses gave a description of the car with the Michigan plates and the driver. What really connected John Collins to the case was the poison oak because it's when the police thought of the body being in Poison Oak, they decided to check for any doctors and hospitals to see if anyone had been treated for Poison Oak recently. John Norman Collins had. And Collins and a friend had been in California around that time as they were towing a stolen camper. But by the time this was all found out, John Collins was already back in Ispilanti. Ten days later, 18-year-old Karen Sue Bynman was found dead. She was a freshman and went to summer school at Eastern Michigan University. Karen Sue Bynman had short hair and had arranged to pick up a hairpiece for a wedding that was coming up. John Collins pulled up alongside her, offered to give her a lift on the back of his bike. Though she didn't know him, she thought she'd take a chance. When they arrived at the shop, John offered to wait for her. Whilst he was in the shop, she mentions to the owner how it was her first time buying a wig and also mentions the fact that she had got a lift on a motorcycle with a stranger. The shop owner was shocked and said to Bynerman about the fact that there was a serial killer around and not to take such big risks. Everybody knew about these killings as fear was running through the community. The shop owner tried to persuade her not to go and get back on the bike with the stranger. It was far too risky. And the hairdresser even offered Sue a lift home, but she turned her down saying she would walk home instead. This isn't what happened though, as both hairdressers had a good look out the window at a man on a motorcycle and see Sue hesitate to go back on. And then it must have been that John Collins persuaded her as she got back on. Sue Bynerman was found in a gully in Ann Arbor. She had been strangled and brutally battered. Meanwhile, police are searching for the killer. David Lyke, a corporal for the Michigan State Police, 
returned home from a two-week vacation and both he and his wife noticed that something wasn't quite right. That there seemed to be blood splatter on the basement floor and bottles of bleach missing and scuff marks on the kitchen floor. Only one person had been in his house looking after their dog whilst they were away and that was David Lyke's nephew, John Norman Collins. This was reported to the officials who already had John Collins as a person of interest due to the descriptions either car or motorbike, which Collins owned at the time. The blood type actually matched Bynerman and also clippings of hair on Bynerman's clothing matched the clippings on the basement floor in David Lyke's house, as David Lyke's children had haircuts before their vacation. John Collins was arrested, and from sources to do with the case, John had confessed in 1970. He was sentenced to life in prison for first-degree murder of Karen Sue Bynerman. He wasn't actually convicted for the other murders. But on July the 11th, 2005, 62-year-old former nurse Gary L. Nesman was charged with the murder of Jane Mixer after the case was reopened in 2001. Advancements in DNA analysis proved that it wasn't part of the Michigan murder case. Letterman was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. This left police wondering about the other victims that Collins wasn't charged for. Was he responsible for all the others? Going back to what psychic Peter Hercos said, they actually found a homemade ladder in David Lyke's basement where Norman Collins had been staying. Also, it was found that Collins was Canadian and not American. Joe Shell lived just across the road from John Norman Collins. And it seems that he had took off to California with a friend to let things cool down in Michigan. But he was only there for a couple of weeks. What ties him to Karen Sue Bynerman was the fact that a police officer who had played against John Collins in college football had seen him with a girl on the back of his bike on that day that Sue Bynerman went missing. And this was another connection. It was the same description of motorcycle as the hairdressers had reported. Please like and subscribe for more content.